Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest lecture. As I mentioned to you previously, I was going to do a series of new lectures, not simply an update of talks I've given before, which is indeed as critical, because if you think about it, as you go through the abdomen and chest, there are only a limited number of organs and organ systems you can talk about. But I was going to try to get more specific. And so this talk is going to be on spend tumors of the pancreas. It's an unusual pancreatic tumor that we do see a reasonable number of. And it's a tumor where the radiologist has the great opportunity to make the correct diagnosis on just one imaging study, that CT. We're going to talk a little bit about management as well. But detection and differentiation from other tumors is going to be something we're going to focus on. So spend tumors or solid pseudopapillary tumors of the pancreas are an uncommon low-grade malignancy that are usually found in younger women. It was described back in 1959 by Franz. The tumor was formally referred to as solid and papillary epithelial neoplasm, which is SPEN, papillary cystic neoplasm. It was called a cystic and solid tumor and a Franz tumor. And the solid pseudopapillary tumor was basically the term that I was coming up with, but basically known as SPEN. And you could see that way back when I wrote this article, Joel Lichtenstein, they fact spelled my name wrong. I had my name changed after this. Abe Dackman, who's still at University of Chicago. Stan Siegelman, who's now retired. And the, uh, the latest and greatest people, uh, you can see James Ortel retired. Arnie Freeman, I think he's somewhere out in Texas. But we wrote this article and we spoke about this unusual tumor. And at that point, this was from the AFIP and Hopkins and other places, and there were 12 whole cases. So let's look at some of the basic facts. Let's look at demographics. The age range is typically teens to late 20s. It's typically females. The mean age is 27, but we've seen spends in 8-year-olds and in 72-year-olds. Depending where you read, the ratio is 9 or 10 to 1. The clinical presentation is commonly vague abdominal pain. It's considered a benign neoplasm with malignant potential, and about 10% of the cases or so are malignant and can metastasize. When surgery is done, five-year survival literally approaches 100%. It makes up less than 2% of exocrine pancreatic tumors, and again, the whole idea about early detection and making the right diagnosis is early management, which would lead to a very high level of survival. If the tumor diagnosis is delayed, patients can develop metastasis, most commonly to the liver. Now, one of the things that's very important about this tumor is that often it's a cystic tumor. Other times it's cystic with solid components and rarely it's mainly solid. Most of the time it's large at time of diagnosis, but other times it can be very small and difficult to visualize unless you're careful. Occasionally it will have duct dilatation, but most commonly there's no pancreatic or common duct dilatation. And it's very straightforward that surgery is the treatment of choice. Now in terms of learning about the CT appearance, we'll go into more detail in a few moments, but it is one of the tumors that contain calcification. Occasionally, it can present with spontaneous bleed. And as I mentioned, duct dilatation, be it pancreatic or common duct, is rare. Now, in terms of calcification of pancreatic masses, we'll speak about that. But remember, adenocarcinoma typically doesn't calcify. Neuroendocrine tumors are what calcifies most commonly. Cirrhosis adenomas also calcify. So we'll speak about that. When the lesions are cystic, then your differential is the cystic pancreatic lesions from cirrhosis adenomas which commonly calcify, to mucinous cystic neoplasms, more common in the body, but also with cystic neoplasms, MCNs. It's an older age, patients in their 40s or 50s, but also it's women. IPMNs, which typically occur in many ages, but not in the younger age population, are smaller. And then, of course, cystic neuroendocrine tumors, but cystic neuroendocrine tumors are more likely, more likely to have increased vascularity, uh, particularly at the periphery, even though they're cystic tumors. Now, we speak about these tumors, and again, the age thing becomes critical to me because I always like to think that when you listen to the history and you look at some of the demographics, you can make a diagnosis. Again, a cystic lesion in the body or body tail of pancreas in a 50-year-old female, 
MCN. And someone under 30, particularly female, it's a spend tumor. So that becomes very, very important. I mentioned before the uh, surgery. An article by Lamb reviewed 452 reported cases of spend and reported that 15% were found to be malignant, defined as having evidence of METs or invasion of adjacent structures. Metastasis reportedly occurred at a mean interval of 8.5 years, and long-term follow-up of these patients, therefore, is indeed going to be required. It's interesting uh, about this acute presentation. Um, there was an article by Mao that reported 8 of 292 cases presented with hemoperitoneum, but that is extremely rare. Most of the time we do see patients, obviously they have a CT scan, so they have abdominal discomfort, which is typically explained, but it's not like the presentation of an acute abdomen. But again, it can happen, though I have to admit, I really don't recall a case in my experience. This article was written by uh, Shuhanth Reddy at Hopkins a couple years ago. It's actually a decade ago, and you can see the usual folks, Cameron, Wolfgang, and you go a little bit further, I'll be on there, and you can see there's my name. And they looked at the Hopkins experience. Long-term outcomes were evaluated in patients over almost a 40-year period, and formal surgical resection could be performed safely and associated with long-term survival. You can see that uh, the median size was in this series 4.5 cm, 34 patients had an R0 resection, one in R1, and one in R2. When the patients did have spread, it was lymph node metastasis and perineural invasion. And after um, we look at the numbers, 94% of the patients uh, survived. So again, it's, it's a lesion where if you detect it, particularly early, patients indeed will do well. Patients occasionally, as you can see from this series, one that one recurrence at 7.7 .7 years after complete resection, who was then treated with gemcitabine and remains alive a little more than a year later. So again, it can recur, so patients will need to be followed. In this article by Reddy, uh, again, went through some of the numbers, the 1% to 2% of pancreatic tumors, the female predominance, the importance of age, and the importance of good management. So let's look at the imaging. How can you make the diagnosis? I guess that's gonna be the question everybody wants to know. How do you make the diagnosis? Well, average size is five centimeters, but again, the range is one to 10, and sometimes I'm seeing more than 10. Cystic and solid with a capsule is very common. Calcifications can be extensive, particularly around the periphery of the lesion, and up to a third of cases have calcification. The lesions are more common in the tail of the pancreas, though I have seen many cases, particularly in the head of the pancreas. And here's some of the lesions. Remember I mentioned that it's cystic, well-defined. Here's a large mass, about seven centimeters. You can see there's no dilated pancreatic duct. The lesion almost looks eccentric, so when you look at the volume rendering, you can see the lesion pushing and splaying the splenic artery, but not involving it. You can see in this case, the lesions coming off the tail of the pancreas. Sometimes I've seen mistakes where the lesions are called retroperitoneal masses, where the lesions are thought to be maybe a gist tumor off the stomach or even a splenic mass, because you can see in this case, it's coming right off the tail. Remember, we said the tail is the most common area. You can look at this lesion carefully and you see both solid and cystic components in the lesion. So that becomes very, very important. And again, with the 3D and the narrow window, you really can appreciate some of the more solid components within the lesion. Very, very classic. Now, if the patient was 60, you could talk about other tumors, IPMNs with malignancy. You could think about serous adenomas. You could talk about a, a, a islet cell tumor, maybe a neuroendocrine tumor, though there's no true enhancement. But again, you can see that it's solid and cystic. Here's, the, again, a few more images of that patient. So when you see this in a younger patient, and this was a younger patient, tail of pancreas, wonderful location, cystic and solid, diagnosis is a spend tumor. Sometimes, again, they're just all cystic, and sometimes you can't even tell, looking at this case, is it stomach? Maybe it's the patient's left kidney. When you start looking at this lesion, which is over nine centimeters, you realize it's coming off the tail of the pancreas, it's exophytic. Look at its density. It looks the same density as the stomach, so it's fluid density. 
There it is with the uh, 3D rendering. It does have a definable wall. Sometimes we see what appears to be a definable wall. Sometimes I wonder if it's compressed pancreatic tissue. But here, very nicely shown. And here it is again. If you look really hard and you have a good imagination, you can maybe see some thin septations, but that may be overcalling things because you can see some densities in the stomach as well. Again, comparing it with the multiplanar, coronal views, and the volume rendering in coronal display. Very classic. Again, if it was a 50-year-old, you would say cirrhosis adenoma, you would say MCN, you would say pancreatic pseudocyst, you might think about a lymphopathelial cyst, because they are somewhat exophytic. Another example, 23-year-old. Could you consider a pseudocyst with a patient of pancreatitis? Yes. But here's a well-defined cystic lesion that has some soft tissue density within it. There it's very nicely shown from arterial phase to venous phase. The most minimal increased septations on the arterial phase compared to the later phase imaging. Here it is again very nicely defined. Again, you see the pancreatic duct, but it's not dilated. And this is a good example of a spend tumor as well. Here it is with cinematic rendering, very nicely shown. A really nice example of compression or slight displacement of the patient's GDA and hepatic artery. But again, as we go through the cinematic renderings, it does have the appearance of a cystic pancreatic tumor. Again, nicely shown, same density as the stomach, which it's adjacent to. And here it is again. One of the things you see from the cinematic rendering is how sharp and define the borders are. Very classic. Another patient, abdominal pain, and you see this pancreatic mass. What's interesting here is this is a 27-ish year old male. Patient had no history of pancreatitis, there's no dilated duct. Could it be a serous adenoma? I guess I would think about that. It's not gonna be an adenocarcinoma. This was a spend tumor. And look at the lesion, well-defined, partially exophytic, no dilated common or pancreatic duct, kind of cystic with some solid components. On the venous phase, which is somewhat classic, you better see the soft tissue densities within the lesion proper, very nicely shown there. And you can see some of the modeled enhancement here as well. There it is in the coronal view, and there it is just also on the patient's um, uh, volume rendered view, all very nicely shown. And here it is on the cinematic. So you can really see the difference, how nicely uh, you can see this lesion. A very, very nice example, well-defined, sharply margined, easy to see. You can see in the cinematic, very nice visualization of hepatic artery, the GDA. There's at best some minimal compression of the GDA, but there's no invasion. And you can imagine this patient will get a Whipple's procedure, very easily done and the patient will do fine. And here's just a few more views isolating the GDA against the patient's tumor. Again, very nicely shown in this example. Another patient, abdominal pain. There's a cystic lesion in the tail of the pancreas. Thin septation, some faint calcification. Now in your mind, you're going through the differential diagnosis. Now this patient, again, if it was older, you would think of MCN, serous adenoma, neuroendocrine tumor, but the patient's young. Look at the septations and then the calcifications. So what are you thinking about? You gotta be thinking about a spend tumor. Even if the patient was a bit older, I might put that at the bottom of my list. There it is on the volume rendering. Again, calcifications, there aren't that many tumors that calcify and spend is up there. We said 30% calcify. Here it is on the cinematic. Again, the model density, cystic with some soft tissue component, very nicely shown here as well. And that was a spend tumor in a 27-year-old. So we had two 27-year-olds that had spend tumors that were male. So again, somewhat interesting, but again, it's 10 or nine to one female over male, but male patients do occur. So it's important to think about that because typically we only think about in female patients. Now again, the lesions can be well-defined, nothing specific. Again, tail is better for spend. Here's a sharply marginated lesion. Again, I might consider a lymphoepithelial cyst. Now, the calcifications, in this article by Buteau, up to about 29% of calcifications. Other articles will say about 33%, which has been our experience, but a third will calcify.
Here's just four images. Calcifications commonly are in the periphery of the lesion, but they can be central, more like a serous cyst adenoma. They can be diffuse around the lesion or very spotty. So again, calcification will be helpful to you, but the patterns of calcification will vary. Here's a 43-year-old female with rim-like calcification. Okay, 7.4 centimeter mass. Again, you could think of a number of other things, including a neuroendocrine tumor. This is a bit atypical, both in terms of age and the pattern of calcification, but SPEN is up there, and that's what it was. Another example, here's a large cystic tumor with large septations, some solid component, and peripheral calcification. Not much, but this was a SPEN tumor. Here it is again, two more images showing just the punctate calcifications that are present. Another example, here it's cystic and solid, well-defined, homogeneous and large, with a very dense central calcification. I surely would have put a serous cyst adenoma, maybe an oligocerous cyst adenoma, near the top of my list, unless the patient was 15, and then it would make it very easy. Now, sometimes they're subtle. Here's a 20-year-old female with abdominal pain and nausea and vomiting. The thought was pancreatitis, perhaps, but there's the cystic lesion, and if you look at the MIP imaging and the volume rendering, you see the coarse calcifications really nicely shown around the edge of the lesion. Based on age, the calcifications, and the mass, we worried about a spend tumor. Here's another case, a more recent example. Cystic lesion with solid components, very coarse calcification in the tail of the pancreas. You can see it very nicely bottom right in the MIP image. Patient had a lesion in the liver, which was hemangioma, but let's look at the lesion a bit more carefully. Cystic lesion with solid component and calcification. There it is axial, and there it is coronal. And you can see this lesion is about 4.3 centimeters. You go through a differential. You definitely have a neuroendocrine tumor up there. Um, MCNs can calcify. This is a bit much for an MCN, but you could think about it. Serous cyst adenoma would be there. Again, the calcifications in this case almost seem to be around, on the coronal views, the edge of the lesion. And this ended up being resected, distal pancreatectomy, and this was a spend tumor. Okay, patients cured. And again, here's just some images showing you the coarse calcification nicely with the MIP imaging. And here it is very nicely showing you the cinematic rendering with the lesion in the tail of the pancreas, the coarse calcifications, the textural change comparing the tail to the head and body of pancreas, very nicely shown in this example. Now, I mentioned age is variable, but here's a great example, abdominal pain. This is 62-year-old female, so you're not thinking about spend at all. There's a low-density lesion. It's very subtle in the head of the pancreas, about 2 cm. It's easier to see on the coronal view. Now, there's no dilated pancreatic or common duct, but a 62-year-old, I'm thinking of an adenocarcinoma of the pancreas. There it is on the venous phase, coronal view, very simple. To me, this is could be an adenocarcinoma. I was not saying a spend tumor. This will be biopsied or resected. This eventually was resected. There it is subtly seen, but nicely shown on the cinematic. You can imagine how easy it is to miss this lesion. One of the things I've noted with cinematic, it makes it a bit easier to see these tumors because you can see the textural change. And this was a two centimeter spen tumor, just a beautiful example. And again, a 62 year old female. So again, within every rule, at least part of the rule was correct, it was a female, but it was a really small lesion, it was a really subtle lesion, and outside the classic age range. We talk about large spend tumors. Look at this mass involving the body and tail of the pancreas. In fact, initially, this was thought to maybe be a gastric gist tumor. You see its interface to the stomach, or even a potentially an adrenal carcinoma. But there it is, a large solid mass, modeled attenuation, I have to admit from size and everything, this is large. There it is on some of the cinematic renderings and you can see the cystic and solid components. Again, neuroendocrine tumor is up there in my differential though I like to see more vascularity but the size, the solid components really bother me. This was resected and this was a spend tumor. So just look at the multiple images from axial to coronal, from volume rendering to cinematic rendering. You can see that it's a beautiful example not only of a large tumor, but the solid components and everything else that goes with it. Another example, mass and head of pancreas, well-defined, sharply marginated. 
You're not going to confuse this with an adenocarcinoma. I agree there. But serous cyst adenoma, perhaps oligocystic. But again, those are usually more cystic. This has soft tissue. There's some change in enhancement between the arterial phase and the venous phase, very nicely shown in that regard. Here it is again on the coronal view. This was a spend tumor. Again, pushing against the portal vein and SMV, but not narrowing it. Mass effect can occur just because anything large enough causes mass effect. As I mentioned, we talk about large tumors, but I've showed you some small ones, and small ones can be missed. So a lesion like this, that's large. The only question is differential diagnosis, and this was a spin. Or this case, solid and cystic. Is this off the pancreas? It's a little bit tricky. You can imagine you could be thinking about a large implant in the left upper quadrant. It's cystic and solid, but if I said metastatic ovarian cancer or a sarcoma, you would have to think about it. It was a young patient. This was a spend tumor. But look at this one, junction of body of pancreas near tail. Low density, faint calcification. Really hard to see. There's no dilated pancreatic duct. Could it be an adenocarcinoma? Sure could, though adenocarcinomas typically don't calcify, and I would expect to see some duct dilatation. If the patient's young enough, you'd be thinking spen, but again, you can see how spen can be difficult. Another example, this was a child under 10. Look at that lesion, about a centimeter in change, posterior aspect of junction of body and tail of pancreas. It's eight millimeters. Look at that lesion. I put a circle around it so you can see it. In fact, like many lesions, it shows better on the patient's coronal view. Now, what else could be in the pancreas in a younger patient, pancreo, pancreaticoblastoma, but those are usually kids under five, and that's exceedingly rare, so is spen, but again, this was a spen tumor. So let's now bring the curtains down and really review what we've spoken about. We spoke about the spen tumor as in the differential of cystic pancreatic masses. We talk about the range in size, the most, the larger. We talk about the lack of peripheral enhancement. We talk about mass effect, but no neovascularity. We talk about it's solid and cystic, and both components are present, and we spoke about this differential diagnosis. We also spoke about the range of tumors. I've showed you a few small ones, even under a centimeter, and I've showed you larger ones, but both are in the five centimeter range. We spoke about how calcification can be very helpful, and calcification typically is in the periphery, but can be central as well. And about a third of cases have calcification. And we showed examples of the head, the body, and the tail all having tumors, though most commonly it's in the tail of the pancreas. We spoke about the importance of early diagnosis because with early diagnosis, the five-year survival is well over 95% and can approach 100%. Again, it's an important diagnosis. The radiologist can often be the one making the diagnosis. So with that, I hope you know everything there is to know about spend tumors, and we'll see you next time. Thanks very much. If you liked what you heard here today, please make sure to hit that subscribe button and visit our website, ctss.com, for lectures, quizzes, pearls, and more. Also, be sure to check out our apps that are available for free on the Apple Store. All links are in the description box below.